Thomas Patera, known as Tommy Karate, was born on December 2nd, 1954 in Brooklyn, New York. His parents were first-generation Italian immigrants from Salerno, and he grew up in the Gravesend neighborhood of Brooklyn. Patera faced constant and relentless bullying during his childhood years due to his high-pitched voice, which led to physical attacks and public humiliation. This experience had a traumatizing and profound impact on him, igniting a fire within that would later manifest in all of his violent tendencies. Patera's fascination with martial arts began at the easily impressionable age of 12 when he was directly inspired by the television show The Green Hornet and actor Bruce Lee. He was particularly drawn to the character of Kato, played by Bruce Lee, which fueled his pursuit of martial arts training. Patera attended a dojo in Sheepshead Bay, Brooklyn, where he excelled due to his vigor and dedication, which quickly pushed him to the top of his class. It would be an understatement to say his dedication to his craft was intense. It was his life mission during that phase. He followed a strict regimen of working out, lifting weights, consistently studying fighting strategies and watching martial arts films. His enthusiasm and commitment took him around the world, all the way to Japan where he immersed himself in the culture of his new community and trained in toga ryu a form of ninjutsu rather than karate. And please know I do apologize if I didn't pronounce that correctly. During his time in Japan, Patera adopted a strict diet of rice and edible seaweed to fuel his desire of peak health. He also read extensively about war and fighting and trained with traditional weapons such as the tonfa, nunchucks, and katanas. This period in his life marked a significant transformation in his maturity and sensibility, as noted by his mother and aunt during their visit to him in Japan. Upon returning to Brooklyn, Patera's martial arts skills and intimidating presence caught the attention of the Banano crime family. He worked himself into the Bonanno family's Lino crew after impressing Anthony Sparrow and soon after established himself as a feared enforcer and hitman. Despite his clever witty nickname, Tommy Karate, it was actually his expertise in Toga Ryu that made him a formidable and polarizing figure in the streets of the underworld. Patera's criminal career was characterized by extreme violence and brutality. It would be hard to dispute that he didn't enjoy violence. I personally get the feeling that he had a hunger for it. This would have undoubtedly created a barrier to forming close trusting relationships because those around him would be aware of the potential consequences of falling out of favor with him. The fear he instilled in others through his brutal methods of enforcing discipline and eliminating rivals would have made it difficult for him to lead a normal personal life too. He reminds me of a more physically skilled and obviously healthier version of the infamous Roy DeMeo because they both lusted after the blood of others. We know he took personal pleasure in the disappearances of others, so much so that he would keep trophies from his victims, such as wedding rings, just like a serial killer would. He certainly didn't discriminate either as he would prey on anyone he perceived as a threat, including friends and even members of his own crew. Patera was also heavily involved in drug trafficking, and he did not hesitate to eliminate dealers or anyone who might compromise his operations or profits. But again, that was minimal compared to his more serious crimes. With that said, law enforcement, in fact, suspected Patera of being involved in as many as possibly 60 hits and disappearances. On August 29, 1988, Patera allegedly attacked and took the life of Wilfred Willie Boy Johnson. Johnson was a longtime associate of the Gambino's boss, John Gotti. Patera and Vincent Kojak Giatino killed Willie Boy because John Gotti had found out that Willie Boy had been a rat since 1966. Patera was charged with taking Johnson's life, but he was acquitted during his trial. His methods of disposal usually involved dismemberment to make it challenging for law enforcement to solve the crimes and link them back to him, which ultimately led to him committing violent crimes with a diabolical confidence. I believe he may have felt untouchable. Patera also took the life of Tala Siksik, a Middle Eastern drug mover, in his own apartment. Investigators eventually found six of Patera's victims in a mob graveyard in Staten Island near the William T. Davis Wildlife Refuge. You don't take part in violence like that without a superiority complex, at least not in my opinion. He became the thing he hated most as a child. He became a bully, a pure victimizer with almost no signs of compassion or empathy. Patera's reign of terror came to an end in 1990 when he was arrested after a three-year investigation by the DEA led by Assistant Special Agent Jim Hunt. It was found Patera's crew sold over 200 pounds of illegal substances and marijuana on average per year. 
FBI agents discovered several automatic weapons, knives, swords, and books such as the Hitman's Handbook and Kill or Be Killed, which were about assassination techniques. In 1992, Tommy Karate Patera was convicted on multiple charges, including murder and drug trafficking, based on the testimony of former associates and physical evidence. One of those witnesses was the nephew of Genovese family capo Rosario Ganji, who had decided to testify against Patera. Frank had been arrested for driving under the influence. While so, he confessed to all the murders he was involved in with Patera and provided detailed info on other Patera crimes. He described how Patera took the life of Ganji's girlfriend, Phyllis Birdie, and Mark Kacharski during a fight. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole and is currently serving his sentence at the USP Big Sandy in Kentucky. Tommy Patera's martial arts prowess could have been a source of discipline, something he used for self-improvement, or a tool that he could have used to enlighten other people. But instead, he became an instrument of terror, an orchestrator of chaos, a tool that was always at the hands of the Bonanno crime family, whenever it was indeed time for violence or to put somebody back in line. And if I must say so myself, he is not someone you want to kick it with.